Hello, I'm Frank Rivero. I'm with Pacific Interment Service, www.interment.com, and this is the Mortuary Channel. Today, I am going to do a brief overview of making arrangements. This is something that we have to do each and every time that we get a first call, which is uh, the first time a family notifies us of a death in their family or a friend or whomever they may be making arrangements with. The paperwork that you see up here, and there are eight forms, all have to be completed by either a licensed funeral director, which I am, or somebody who has had training and there's multiple ways to get that training. Uh, you can go through um, the California Funeral Directors Association. We'll put a link down below for that. They offer classes. Uh, it's done online now due to COVID. And uh, if you take that class, you will get a um, certificate like this. It's an arrangement counselor's certificate. This happens to be my son's. Um, if you are actually a licensed funeral director, which uh, we'll put a link to the Department of Consumer Affairs website so you can see what the study um, guide looks like for that and the testing requirements and you also have to have a couple years of college to be able to get a funeral director's license in the state of California. Ultimately, you'll get a license that looks like this and this is my license. I've had it for decades and um, it served me well. So let's get started. The paperwork, there's two ways to do this paperwork. On our website, www.interment.com, you can go to the top right hand corner and there's a link there that says uh, make arrangements online. If you click that link, it's going to open up a form much like this one. This is an arrangement form and it is used to collect the vital statistics information that uh, we need in order to complete the non-medical portion of the death certificate. It also asks us what the disposition, the ultimate disposition, either burial, cremation, whatever it may be, and where the remains will be either interred or um, scattered at sea or uh, a multitude of other dispositions if they're going home with a relative, something like that. It, that this form will ask all those questions. It also asks where the decedent is. So if hospital or convalescent home or at home, all that's on this form. So when you fill this out online, the um, program that we have, and it's unique to us, will uh, populate all the rest of these forms with the appropriate information and send you back an email to sign the form online electronically. But I'm going to go through the old way of doing this and it's still applicable some people just cannot uh, maneuver doing this online so we can meet with them at either one of our two locations and sit down and make these arrangements in person um, so this would be the first form that I start with and the information that I'm collecting here will help me fill out the rest of these forms and essentially the it asks for the decedent's name, um, their date of birth, their state of birth or country, if they were born out of the U.S., social security number, their marital status. Um, by the way, the marital status, um, the person cannot be single, or we can't use that, that designation. It has to be either married, divorced, widowed, or whatever may be applicable, but sing single is not acceptable for the uh, Department of Public Health. Their education, whether they had any Hispanic background, their race, their usual occupation, the kind of business, how many years they were in that occupation, their last home address with the city and the county, the zip code, how many years they were in the county and what state that address is in. The name of a surviving spouse, if one exists, uh, if not, any one of these forms could have dashes on them and that's okay, or unknown is also acceptable. Um, the name of the father, uh, first, middle, and last, their state of birth, the name of the mother, first, middle, and last, maiden name, and their state of birth. The disposition date which we fill in, the final place of disposition that's given to us by the family or the next of kin. Um, 
the type of disposition, uh, the place of death, the county of death, uh, whether it was in a hospital or if it was a convalescent home, and if they were in a hospital, was it in the ER or were they inpatient. Um, once we have all this filled out, we ask that the person making the arrangements, usually a next to can or a durable power of attorney or somebody who's responsible for the decedent, uh, that they sign here and date it so that we have some document showing that this information is all correct. So we have them review it and um, once they sign, we will create the electronic death certificate, which is how it's done in California. And before we file the death certificate, we do send a uh, family member a working copy, make sure that uh, there are no errors, that we didn't do commit any typos um, during the data input, or that there wasn't any mistakes on this form that weren't caught during the original arrangements. So once we have this complete, um, and this is for a cremation, there are some forms that cross over for both cremation and burial, I'll explain that in a little bit, but this is the basic set of forms that we need to complete your cremation. Um, this is an authority to cremate. As you can see along this side, there are spaces for the next can to initial and what they're doing is uh, acknowledging that they've read these paragraphs and that they agree to these paragraphs and then at the bottom there's a place to sign with their uh, relationship, print their name, their address, and their phone number. This essentially, it's a very standard form, it's used in California but it's also used in many other states and, and what it's saying is that number one that the person who's signing this actually has full authority to make these arrangements. We have to have the nearest living next of kin do these arrangements by law. Um, it asks for the individual's name, what the um, final disposition is going to be, whether it be sea scattering, return to family, or special handling. Special handling could be could mean many things. It could be mailing the cremated remains to somebody out of state or out of the country. There's just a lot of different options there. Um, these on the side here, they talk about different things that the family members must agree to in order for us to legally proceed with a cremation. One of them is asking about uh, implanted devices. The only one that we're really concerned about here are pacemakers. They do explode. They have a battery in them. They could damage the equipment. So we have to remove those prior to inserting the remains into the retort. Um, here it talks about um, how the cremation proceeds, that uh, each cremation is done individually, which is state requirement, um, that the uh, machines are completely swept out, but there could be some incidental commingling left behind. Um, as you may have seen in one of my other videos, the floors are made out of uh, refractory material. Uh, we do our best to get all the cremated remains out but obviously we can't tear out the floor after every cremation or do anything really beyond just making sure that we're very thorough in the sweep out process. Um, here it talks about the um, time frame for the individual to pick up the cremated remains. We have legal constrictions on how long we can hold cremated remains as a crematory here. So we have to ask that the families abide by that and come in here and pick up the cremated remains or if they made some other arrangements like having us see scatter them or having us mail them to someone else or them if they're from out of state then those have to be accomplished pretty quickly 30 days is the rule um, this one talks about implanted devices now the one that we remove pre-cremation would be a pacemaker uh, Depending on the circumstances surrounding the person's death, there could be a lot of different implanted devices um, pre-mortem. Uh, chemo pumps, those are generally made out of plastic. We do not have to remove them and they are incinerated with the, with the remains. Uh, but other things like uh, what the medical field calls retained metal, in other words, if somebody has a hip replacement or a knee replacement or they've had a bone break and they needed some type of um, reinforcement with steel or pins or anything like that, those things are um, retrieved after the cremation process. 
and uh, here it just allows us to dispose of those items. Um, and then the last one is just a blanket uh, kind of legalese, talks about the obligation of the crematory shall be limited to cremation of the remains of the individual named herein, and no warranties are expressed or implied um, for beyond what we've agreed to do, which is to take care of this process from the death through the return of the cremated. This form is a disclosure of pre-need funeral agreement. This is required by California. It may or may not be required in your state, depending on where you live, but here we must have this signed by a family member. And what it does is it, it requires the funeral director to disclose to the family if the individual has come in uh, at a prior date or someone on their behalf has contacted us at a prior date and made prepaid funeral arrangements here. We keep files here for all those. those uh, those monies are put in trust. Uh, we use California Master Trust here, but there are many different ways of uh, trusting the money. Um, so once we check our files and make sure that we do not have a prepaid funeral trust, then we put does not. On the other hand, if we do have one, then we put does, and we're required to present the family a copy of it. This is an authorization to accept or decline embalming. Um, this is also required by the state of California. It may not be required in other states. You know, check your local jurisdictions to see what their requirements are. But anywhere in the state of California, you must have this as part of your paperwork. Um, basically, what this is advising the Mexican or the family member uh, that embalming is the replacement of body fluids by chemical preservatives and the application of chemical preservatives for temporary preservation of the body. And then in bold letters you'll see here, I understand that embalming is not required by law. And it in fact is not, and is really not necessary for, a, for instance, a direct cremation or even a cremation where there's a um, an ID view or some other service, um, but frankly you can't require it for any service, the, the state of California forbids that. Um, then it talks about, well, that the person who is an Mexican, their name, and whether they do or they do not want embalming, and then it asks for the location and the name and address of the place where the embalming takes place. In, in our particular case, all our embalmings happen here. Uh, we have an a, a embalming facility in the back next to the crematory, uh, so we do everything in-house. Uh, at some later video, I'm going to do a video not of an embalming, but just of the room itself and the equipment and you know what we have uh, as far as instruments and things like that to give someone just a very basic overview of what that involves. Here we have a declaration for disposition of cremated remains. Again, this is a state regulatory required form, and at least for the state of California. Uh, what it does is it asks the family member or the person handling the arrangements to sign in two locations. One, as the person with the legal right to control the disposition, or if it, they're making pre-arrangements for themselves, then it would be them with a date and the other one with a person contracting for the cremation services. Usually those two are the same but there are occasions when they're not and if they're not then we would need two, two different signatures on this form. But what this form accomplishes is number one it tells the um, Mexican who the crematory is and, uh, and who the funeral home is and they're not always the same. There are, um, actually, most of the funeral homes do not have their own crematory. Uh, they use either outside crematories or they use a cemetery. There's many different ways that it can be accomplished, but um, 
this form will ask for the, uh, the name of the decedent, it'll ask for the name of the funeral home and the telephone number, and then it asks for the name of the crematory and the crematory's uh, telephone number. And the last thing it wants to know is what's going to happen to the cremated remains. So are they, again, are they going to be sea scattered or are they going to be returned to a family member? If so, what's the address that they're going back to? Are they going to be buried in a cemetery? Um, if so, what's the name and address of the cemetery? So that's what this form accomplishes and it is um, required, again, by the state of California for us to have this form. Here is a release form. This form would be useful for uh, people who are in hospitals, sometimes convalescent homes require them. Uh, most of them do not. They have a four-hour window for us to come and remove the decedent from a convalescent home. So generally they're not too worried about this. They have their own forms that they have a sign saying that we've picked up the, the remains in good condition. And we sign that, whoever is the attendant that uh, went out to do the removal. Uh, but if it's a hospital, they're going to want to see this form. So this form uh, will also suffice for some of the coroners and medical examiners offices in this area, but not all. Uh, what we want here is the uh, decedent's name, the location of the decedent, so whatever the name of the hospital is, and uh, the name of the claimant, and that should be the next of kin, and the address of the claimant with a phone number. And down here, it basically gives different choices to identify who exactly is the claimant and what their relationship is. Now, hospitals generally have that identified at the time of death. They know if the person's married, that the, who the husband or the wife is. If, if they're not married, but they have children, then who they are. Um, but in the end, we need a signature here and a date. And we would be presenting this to a hospital or in the event a convalescent hospital wants it to a convalescent hospital. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, this release would be okay for some, but not all, of the coroner slash medical examiner's office in San Francisco. They have a, it's called the SFMEO for short, San Francisco Medical Examiner's Office. Um, there's a difference, and I'll get to explaining that probably in, a diff in another video, uh, what the difference is between a medical examiner and a coroner. Uh, but there is a difference. Uh, the most basic thing is the medical examiner's office is run by a forensic pathologist, a doctor, where a coroner's office is run by the sheriff of that county. Uh, there are other nuances, and again, I'll have to make a different video. It's, it, this is not really about that, but this is a release for the San Francisco Medical Examiner's Office. As you can see, it looks totally different from our hospital release form. So this is a form that we produce and we generate. This is a form that they produce and they generate. The San Francisco Medical Examiner's Office will not release a decedent on this form. With one exception, actually, if, the, if there was a pre-need a prepaid pre-need in place and they had signed this form, then the medical examiner's office will allow the pickup using this form, but that's the only exception. This form would be needed for anybody who's passed away. The family would have to fill this out. And this uh, form, along with several other counties that require their specific forms, are all automatically generated on our website, interment.com, when the uh, question about where the decedent is, is answered by the family member. Then the last form is our contract, and this is a basic um, service contract. And what it does is it, it has at the top for the license number of which funeral home. We have two, so there'd be, if it was San Francisco, it'd be 1454. If it was our Emeryville location, it would be 1506. That's our license number. Um, then it asks for the decedent's name, the date of death, the place of death, and the date of the statement. Now, our basic cremation uh, that we that we provide, which is called a direct cremation, is twelve hundred and fifty dollars. But it has to be broken down here on this side of the form. The state requires that. So the first breakdown is professional service fees, and the professional service fees covers uh, our overhead, this building that I'm sitting in you know, our uh, payroll, our taxes, um, 
you know, all the equipment that we need uh, here to be able to operate, our phone bill, our insurance, all those things are covered under professional service fees. And that's 555. Um, the removal, which is the actual pickup of the remains from wherever the deceased is, is $400. The containers collectively, and there's two that are both required. One of them is a cremation container. You've seen it in a previous video. It's just a very simple cardboard box. Nothing fancy about it, but it does suffice and comply with state law as far as the uh, container needed to put a decedent in. And the other one is a temporary urn. It's a black plastic container. It's um, very sturdy. It uh, seals. It's um, TSA approved, if you're going to travel, it's really the, the, the best urn to carry it with you if you're going to go on a flight with the cremated remains. And it can be buried. I mean, it, it's reasonably useful. We do have other urns for sale, both on our website and here at the mortuary, if somebody wants something a little fancier or different to, uh, you know, memorialize their loved ones. We have lots available to choose from, but we generally don't advocate for that pretty simple, we try to keep things simple. The last um, charge would be the actual cremation itself and that's $275, that's what we charge here to do the cremation itself. Again, we don't send any of that out, it's done here at our Emeryville facility and those charges collectively come up to $1,250 and that's our basic cremation fee. We have a um, price list on our website. You can check out the prices for everything that we do. It's all there. Um, there are some additional costs that are involved here. One of the costs is, um, these are called cash advances, and for lack of another term, I would use pass-throughs. So, uh, death certificates, it shows, it asks how many, and at what cost, and the total. The reason for that is that death certificates are different. Here in the Bay Area, each county has their own cost for death certificates. In San Francisco, they're $21. Um, in San Mateo, they're $23. In Alameda, they're $21. Berkeley, which is the only, actually there's two in the state of California, Berkeley's one of them. The only city that actually takes care of their own vital registration is Berkeley. Berkeley charges $23 for their death certificates. Contra costs us 25 so you know we can generally tell the family based on where the person died how much the death certificates are going to cost them and if they want us to order them then we put it on this contract. Um, the disposition permit is $12 that's again a statutory fee that's straight across the board doesn't matter which county but that is a fee that uh, is charged. Um, and then the Department of Consumer Affairs tax or fee, which you can see a line for it down here, is um, paid on a quarterly basis to the State of California Department of Consumer Affairs uh, Cemetery and Funeral Board. So we charge $8.50 to the family on this side of the contract per cremation every quarter. I have to add up how many cremations we did, multiply that by $8.50, and we send it into the state. That fee actually covers a part of the regulatory cost, so people who are licensed, uh, would, uh, that helps with the licensing program. It also helps with our inspection program, and I don't mean ours, it's the state's, but we get inspected regularly, and that's what that fee's for. Um, in closing, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. We have an 800 number, 1-800-442-1810. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, our website is www.interment.com, I-N-T-E-R-M-E-N-T. -E -E um, or um, you can call either one of our facilities, San Francisco, 415-431-9940. Uh, and in Emeryville, it is 510-450-0187. Uh, I hope this helped clear up some of the uh, mysteries involved in what happens as far as the paperwork logistics in this industry. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.